Okay, so my name is Aviran Mordo. I'm, I'm the head of backend engineering at Wix. And today I'm going to tell you about how we do continuous delivery at Wix. Uh, how many of you are doing continuous delivery? Raise of hand. Not too many. How many of you heard about continuous delivery and know what that is? Good. So, plenty of Okay, so you have already spoke about Wix, so I'm... I won't tell you what we do, we do web publishing platforms. Um, so when, usually when we speak about continuous delivery, it says we deploy m many times a day, like 10 times a day, 20 times a day. And people ask me, wow, that's really brave of you. Uh, it takes cats, how, how can you do it? You don't break production. Um, and it actually, it's not, that brave of us. When you put all, all the um, protections and safeguards in place, it's actually it's not that hard. Um, you do have to invest a lot in putting those uh, in place, but it's not that hard. So I'm going to tell you about some of the things that we do that allows us to deploy 10 times a day. Um, but before that, I want to show you uh, these numbers. Um, I just pulled these numbers like from the past six months. And what those are, are the things that we did in the first half of the year. So we did 1,500 deployments. Uh, we ran 470 A-B tests, and we had around 200 feature toggles. Um, Key points about continuous delivery, what that is. Um, basically, you abandon the versioning. There, there's, there's no such notion as a version. You go to a feature-centric development, you develop a feature. Once the feature is ready, you push it and deploy it to production. You automate everything. Uh, you move to uh, test-driven development, which is highly critical. Uh, when you deploy many times a day, everything has to be automated. You cannot rely on QA. QA uh, manual QA is slow. Um, and you measure everything. You run A-B tests, you run feature toggles, you define your KPIs and the business KPIs. It's not hardware KPIs. You define what is good for your business. What does it mean that I perform good? Um, so test-driven development, uh, that's the first thing that's, that has to be done. All new code is being pushed to Git, is fully tested. There is no code that is being pushed without its test. And that includes unit test and integration test. Uh, right now we have around 10,000 tests in our build environment. And we, at the back end at least, we have no QA at all. The developers are the ones that are writing the test with the code or before the code, um, but it's highly crucial. No, no, push has been, no code is being pushed without its test. Um, when at, at the rare occasion where we find a bug, doesn't happen too often, uh, the process is before you actually fix a bug, the first thing you do is you write an automated test to reproduce the bug. And once you wrote the test and test naturally failed because you have a bug, you fix the bug and the test passes. And that ensures that there will, no, there will not be any regression for that bug. For legacy systems, I know not everybody has the luxury of writing a new code. Um, we at Wix uh, replaced basically all our legacy code. But before that, um, we had legacy systems. So with legacy systems, you can't write like the unit test. There, there are, there's a big blob of spaghetti code. And it's really hard to write unit tests for code that you probably don't know. The people who wrote it already left. But you cover it with integration tests. Integration tests uh, are doing end-to-end uh, -end flows, but it gets you to the place that you feel comfortable in the quality of the legacy systems. 
it takes time to write those tests and you don't write them at first, but every time you have you change, you need to change something in the legacy system. First, you write the integration test. You say, okay, this is how it works. Now I'm going to change it and I'll know what I will not break the code. Um, when you do test driven development, um, I talked to a lot of developers and they said, well, testing is hard. And when you do TDD, it takes longer to write the code. And why do we even write, need to write testing? Well, we write without bugs, right? Um, so it's not entirely true. Uh, from our experience, once we switched to TDD, uh, we found that we develop much faster. Um, we remove the fear of change. It means when we're working in a service-oriented architecture. So if I write a service and I need uh, a new API from a different service, which I don't own, uh, I will not write that code for the new API. Uh, uh, sorry, the owner of the other service will not write the code. I will write the code because I'm pretty sure that the, the service is covered with tests. I can go to that service, even without knowing it, I can write the code and be pretty sure that I will not break anything. Of course, I do it with the review and with the owner of the service, but it removed the sphere of changes. The, the, the statement is, it works, don't touch it. It doesn't exist anymore because you're not afraid of breaking anything. If you'll break something, then the test will break and you can fix it and you'll have an immediate um, uh, notification that something bad went. Um, like I said, uh, uh, do we really need QA? Well, on the service side, we have no QA at all. Everything is automated. Everything, uh, all the testing are being written by the developers. On the front end side, which is HTML, JavaScript, we do have QA, um, and that's because of the way um, they work. TDD actually make us uh, reach to production. Al although it takes longer to write the code because you have to write the test and a lot of the times writing the test is more difficult to actually writing the code. Um, so you write the feature uh, slower, but it gets to production much faster because the quality of the code that we're writing is much higher. So it allows us to deploy a lot faster. You don't have to spend time in writing the code, pushing it to QA, then they'll find bugs and they'll bring it back to the developer, it fixes the code, it goes back to QA, and then goes to production, you find the bugs in production, you roll back. So this allows us to get uh, features to production much, much faster than, than we ever had uh, before. And if you'll ask the, the developers at Twix that work before we switch to TDD, and after a while when they understand what TDD means and, uh, and the benefits of test-driven development, and they will tell you, there is no other way of working. Although it, um, I repeat that, it's hard. Doing TDD is hard. It's a craftsmanship. It's like writing any other software. It's like learning a new language. You have to know how to write tests. But that's the only way that you can actually produce a better quality uh, of code. So we wrote the test and we now Okay, we now want to deliver it to production. So we need to put some safeguards. Um, and one of the safeguards that uh, we put in the code is feature toggles. So before I, I speak about feature toggles, um, I'll tell you about how we uh, write the code. So when we write the codes, everybody write, uh, pushes to the trunk. Okay, there, there is no feature branches, there's nothing. Once you write the code, you do a push, it goes to the, to the trunk. And since we're doing continuous delivery, this code can reach production anytime by anyone. Every, everyone in the, in the R&D 
pushing a code to production is basically pressing a button. We have a web interface, you press a button and it's on production. So the developer who pushes the code have no control of when this code will reach production. So if I push a code that it's not ready, I need to safeguard um, from being reached to production. And that's being done by feature toggles. So feature toggle is basically uh, a code branch. So this is the normal uh, flow of your application. And there is a feature toggle. It's basically an if in the code. And if the feature toggle is open, then we run the new code. And if not, then we run the old code. The new code doesn't have to be ready. If the feature toggle is closed, it's not being run. So I'm safe. There's no fear of pushing uh, unfinished code to production. Uh, this is an actual screenshot from of a feature toggle that we have at Wix. It's basically an if in the code. See, if feature toggle, we have a feature toggle manager that manages all our feature toggles. If it's a new feature toggle is active, then do the new code. If not, that's then go to the uh, to the old code. Um, so in continuous delivery, we also deploy without downtime. So it's nice to have feature toggles and everything when you deploy a new code. But what happens if you need to do database changes? You need to change the schema. Uh, so what we do, uh, there, are, there are several use cases. If you need to add a column to a database, um, when we're working with millions of records in a database, doing an alter table uh, is out of the question. Alter table locks the whole database for from minutes to hours, depending on the size of the database. So we can't really do that. So if we need to add a column, we just put it in a different table on the side and with primary key linked to, to the new table. Uh, Another thing that we do is we try to add for every table that we use, uh, a relational table, I'm not talking about NoSQL, um, we have a column which contains a blob. So because you cannot really predict uh, our systems are evolving and you cannot really predict uh, what are the future needs. So we, we try to add a blob column which is stored in a JSON format. And as long as you don't have to index it and search by it, it's just a, a data that you need to retrieve by a, a different key, uh, there's no problem. You can just add more um, fields to that blob. It's a JSON. You read, the, you read the, the row. You have the JSON. You parse it, and you add whatever you want to it. If you want to remove a column, we just do, don't do anything. We just don't use it. We just leave it there. It doesn't bother anyone. But that's the easy case. Okay, now what happens if we want to actually uh, migrate databases? Okay, we move from one database to another, or do a complete um, schema change. So this is again where feature toggles come to to our aid. So what we do is we have two databases. Okay, we have the old database and we have the new database. Remember, we have to do it without any downtime. Um, so we got the gray fish and the goldfish, and they need to migrate from one database to another. So first we put the, the, the new database in place, and we have a feature toggle in the code where we actually use the database. So, and the feature toggle has uh, states. So the first state is just write to the old database, read from the old database, nothing changes, everything works as, as before. And now we start the... Um, the the migration we start populating the new the new schema so every time we do a write we route to both databases but still reading from the old one it has the old schema and we're doing that in order to protect us from uh, unknown circumstances where we hold a big blobs in memory and writing to the new database might be slow and if it that doesn't work and we see problems, we just turn the notch on the feature toggle, go back to the old schema, reading and writing from the old database, nothing happens. 
We let that run for a while, for about a week or two, and even a month. And once we feel comfortable when we're doing the writes to both database and, and the system is healthy and nothing happens, then we start reading from both, from both databases. What does it mean? Because we populated the new database uh, with data and we let it run for a few weeks, then we start writing, uh, reading from the new database and for records we can't find, we just fall back to the old one. Remember, we're still writing to both databases. This is reversible too. If something happened during this process, we can always switch back to feature toggle two or, free, or state or the first state. Go go back. Now we let that run for uh, about a week or two or, or a month, and now it's time. Okay. Now we're gonna uh, do the unreversible. The point of no return is the, the fourth state when we stop writing to the old database. Uh, and we read from both. So we, re re we write everything to the new database. We try to read from the new database, and if the record doesn't exist there, we just fall back to the old one. Um, so this gives us a time to do the eager migration. So uh, the system works and behaves, no downtime. And then during our own free time, during off-peak hours, we just do the eager migration from the old database to the new. And eventually, we just write from the new. And everything is on the new database. And we close the feature toggle. And we're all happy. And we need to do it again. Um, we're actually, this process of, uh, of uh, database migration happens like about two or three times in the last year and with no downtimes. So feature toggles are, uh, are not just on, off, or, or state. We can also, we can, um, it's used for uh, gradual exposure of new features. Not everything gets the new feature. Uh, and they're being used as a technical feature toggles. So first we open a feature toggle for uh, like the company employees. We have several strategies of exposing new features. So first of all, it's uh, company employees or specific users or by geolocation. Geolocation is a great tool if you want to expose uh, client-side code. So let's say we have a new JavaScript code. So, and we don't want the whole world to be affected, all, all our users to be affected by this code. So what we do is we use feature toggle to give, let's say, by geolocation, to like, like just users in Germany will get the new JavaScript, everyone else will get the old one. And we test that and we look at the monitoring, see no, no errors, then we just increase it to more geolocations and eventually we open it to, to everyone. Um, you can use whatever strategies, you know, we're a web company, so these are based on uh, web prefixes, so user agent, uh, Gale uh, language, or if you have a profile base, you can uh, use it by any profile or any context that you have in your systems. Now, this is not enough. Um, when we're doing technological feature toggles like writing in database or using an old code, so we, we deploy to a cluster of servers. It's never just one server, so it's at least two or, or more servers. So let's say I wrote uh, a new algorithm that I don't know how, how it will perform. If it will perform bad, then the server will have like a huge CPU load uh, because I can't really test it on real production uh, uh, traffic on staging. So we use feature toggles also to start to run new code, but not on all the servers. So let's say I have a cluster of five servers uh, of, of, of a specific service. So I open the feature toggle based on just one server. So one server will run the new code. The rest of them will run the old code. I'll monitor that and see everything is good. Then I'll just open it to the rest of the servers. This is another uh, safeguard that we put in place so we will not crash the whole cluster 
at worst, the worst case is one server went down. Uh, we ha I have four more that running the application. Um, database migration and refactoring that affect performance. Those are used by uh, those are use cases where we use uh, we open a feature toggle on a specific server. Uh, another way to override the feature toggles is by URL parameter. So we use that for uh, internal testing. So w when we uh, upload a new feature, it's in production, it's closed, nobody can see it, but we want to test it before we expose it to, to our customers. So we can have uh, special URL parameters. We send email to, to our uh, internal um, people in the company and say, well, use this URL and see this feature on and test it for us on production, on your real user. And they do that. Uh, and we decide, well, this is good. Then we start opening by Geo or whatever, any other uh, parameter. And another thing, another important thing, uh, we have customers all over the world, and we have we have literally uh, dozens of feature toggles and A/B tests in production at any given point. So if uh, if I have a feature toggle that is open, let's say for uh, United States, and some customer calls our support and says, "Well, this new feature doesn't work for us," but our support people are here in Israel, so they can't see what the user sees, right? So we use also um, feature toggle override, so they can put a URL parameter to actually fake the geolocation of of, uh, of the support. So they can experience exactly what our users in the United States are experiencing, and they can help them. But this is all good when you have a, a request request response uh, uh, web, right? So. But what happens if we're a web application, right? So it's a, everything's done with AJAX, and you can't really send URL parameters. Uh, this is why we have uh, another uh, uh, override mechanism: is the is the cookie. You can set a, a special cookie, so when your web application sends AJAX requests, it's being sent with the cookies, and the cookies actually override whatever uh, feature toggle is open or not. Um, this is our, our console to manage feature toggles. Everybody can go and edit feature toggles and open and change them. Uh, any change will actually send an email and be, be logged. Another uh, mechanism uh, that we have is A-B testing. Everybody knows what A-B testing, right? Uh, a-B testing is similar, but slightly different than, than, uh, than feature toggles. Uh, while feature toggles, we protect ourselves against um, software glitches and technical uh, uh, issues. In A-B test, we measure new features. Okay, we measure how good that is for a customer. Everything is tested. There is nothing that's being uh, pushed to production, a new feature, without being A-B tested. Even the slightest things. Um, I, I have a funny story to tell about that. So one of our, our product managers decided, OK, we, we, we sell subscriptions. So we have a, anybody can, can create a, a free website, and we try to push them, OK, upgrade and purchase this premium package, right? So one of our product managers decided, well, how about I'll put a link inside the HTML editor to the purchase page? Sounds reasonable, right? Well, we want to push them to purchase a premium package. So we did that without doing any A-B testing. So well, I'm just put, I'll just put a link on, just a small link on the bottom of the editor that they can do. And he put the link, and we didn't really notice that. Two weeks later, we look at the reports and we see like a drop in conversion, and we're starting to think, well, what did we do? All the tests are looking fine. We didn't do anything that is special that should change the user behavior. 
and suddenly the, the product manager, well, I did put the link over, over there in the editor. I didn't think, well, it should improve conversions because I'm pushing them to the purchase page faster, right? Uh, well, turns out it's wrong because the intent of the user wasn't to purchase. The intent of the user inside the editor was to build a website. Once he's happy with the website, then he can go and purchase. The, the fact that he, that he put the link there just just moved users to the purchase well, to the purchase page without any intent, which caused a drop in conversion. Well, he didn't do that in A/B test because if he if he would have done it in uh, and tested that, we would have seen that the user that saw the link and pressed the link would have a much lower conver conversion rate than the user who didn't. Uh, 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 saw the link. So, um, in any A-B test, we define a KPI. What are we measuring? Are we measuring conversion? Are we measuring uh, open rate of editors? We need to measure business KPIs. What is interested? What are we interested to test? Um, it's an interesting effect on the product. Our product manager are so accustomed to do A-B testing that every new feature has to be tested. There's no no features uh, are being pushed to product, regardless how small that is. You add a button, you change an icon, you, you change the color, everything is tested. And if it's good, we keep it. If it's bad, we just improve and change or just throw it away. Now, when doing A-B tests, especially on the web, you got two kinds of users. You got the anonymous users who you actually don't know anything about, and you got the registered users. Anonymous users are the ones that goes to the, to the home page, and you actually want to convert them, let's say, from an anonymous user to a registered user. You want to make them register, right? So. You create a test for anonymous users. The problem with testing anonymous users is if you change something on the screen, you can't really guarantee the same user experience if they switch to another browser. So anyone happens when it goes to, G or to Google page and they saw a link and then switch to a different browser and he didn't get the link? Happens to me. <laughs> Uh, but this this is exactly the problem. The problem is that you because you don't know anything about the user, the user is not authenticated. When you switch browser, you cannot keep the user experience. The way to keep user experience on the same browser is by putting a cookie on, on the browser. Uh, for registered users, the, it's much easier because you have the user ID, you know uh, what the user is, and you can keep the, the experience. Even if the user changes browsers, you can still give it the same uh, uh, experience because you know who that is. Um, again, with A-B test, we have the same um, uh, filters. We can do A-B test by geolocation, user agent, operating system, whatever uh, things you have. Um, we don't mix anonymous the testing with registers testing. And again, with A-B test, we can do the, the override thingy. So our support can experience exactly what our users are experiencing. Uh, testing can be stopped, started, and paused. What pause means is whoever got the, the, the test in the, in the test, will keep his user experience, but no new users will get uh, uh, tested. Uh, one more thing about, very important things about if you're doing uh, testing on, especially on the web, is that bots, they're not a player in the game. Bots will always get whatever uh, experience, the old experience, whatever it is everybody else. If you close the test, this is the experience that bots will get. You don't want to confuse bots with Sometimes Google, it's bots are mostly anonymous, right? So sometimes bot, Google bot will see uh, one version of the homepage. The second time it comes and crawl and see another version of the homepage. You don't want to confuse the bots. So bots are out of the game. Uh, again, manage your A-B testing. 
Um, another safeguard, self-test. When you do a continuous deployment, you deploy 10 times a day, 15 times a day, and you need to be sure that the deployment went uh, correctly without any problems. So you don't deploy the whole uh, the whole cluster at once. You do gradual deployment. You deploy one server, and if that goes through, then you deploy the next server. Now, for after every deployment, what we do is the server self checks itself. It checks that the configuration uh, that Chef configure basically when we deploy, Chef does the, the deployment and configure whatever configurations that it needs. So after, before Chef continues to deploy the, to the next server, the server actually self-tests itself. So it uh, checks that if it has a database connection, goes and look at the database and see that it has a connection. If it has a, an arrest or RPC endpoints configured, it goes and checks that they're alive and everything is configured correctly. If everything is configured correctly, then the deployment continues. Uh, and if it's not, then everything stopped and rolled back. Um, we go, can go and see if, if a self-test uh, failed. We, we have an immediate view of what failed in the test. And I'm almost done. So uh, where are we today? Uh, since we moved to continuous delivery, we rewrote our entire infrastructure, our entire product from Flash to HTML5 in just four months. Uh, we put uh, developer APIs for third-party development in six weeks. And this is the graph of uh, deployments per day that uh, you can see. Um, that's it. If you want to read more about uh, Wix experience in continuous delivery, I wrote a series of blog posts uh, over here. And you can download this presentation. Thank you very much. Any questions?